So this topic, area under a curve, is, is kind of bonus. I'm not going to test you on it uh, using numerical methods to find the area under a curve. But before we do our lecture on exact area under a curve and definite integrals, I want to just look at this because it, it's the background, right? It's, it's what we build these definite integrals from. We're revisiting this graph, this uh, velocity time graph, and maybe you remember we talked about reaching past this and thinking that acceleration because it's a slope of the graph. It's like the derivative of velocity with respect to time. And then we said, well, distance, because it will be velocity multiplied by time, is, uh, is like the antiderivative of anywhere in the graph. So we're going back to that. If I find the area under the graph, I can figure out the distance. So I could ask a question like at 32, I guess that's where it ends, at 32 seconds, how far am I from my house if I started from my house? Okay, slow writing. And we can just kind of start making shapes and finding their areas because they will rep a represent a distance. So the first thing I see a rectangle, I always go for the rectangle first. I see this rectangle is 10 high and seven wide, which means this area is 10 times seven, 70 meters is the distance it represents. And now I'm into triangles, that's fine, that's fine. Base times height divided by two, that's our area formula for a triangle. So if I go to this bad area here, base is five, height is, 10 divided by 2, that's 25 meters. This rectangle uh, looks like it is 4 for a base, and then, yep, yeah, 10 for the height, divide by 2 equals 20 meters. And then I can go over to, now we're going to go past this, once again, beyond what you need, into the other part of the graph. There's two triangles that are below the x-axis, so so be it. That is fine. The base for this one, I believe, is 12, when I count. Is that 28, 16 to 28? Yep. The height is negative 5, and I'm going to leave that negative. And I'm going to divide it by 2 and get negative 30 meters. The area is negative, so is the distance, because the time is not going to be negative. And uh, our last triangle is just a little 4 times negative 5 divided by 2 equals negative 10 meters. So what is this telling us with distance? This graph, if you see on a velocity uh, time graph, if, if the curve is positive, that means you're moving away from something. But if the curve is negative, you're walking back because your distance is negative. So neat aside, so how far away am I? I went 25 plus 70 plus 20 away for a total of 150 meters away from my house. And then I walked back, let's say this is this way. I walked back 30, negative 30, and another 10 equals negative 40 meters. So my total distance from my house right now, 115 minus 40 equals 75 meters. That seems useful to me, being able to figure out the area under a curve has applications for sure. But the problem is, this is not how we move. This is how, not how curves look. Curves are ugly and I can't just fix like chunky polygons, one polygon that's going to do everything for me. But maybe I can split the area up into little slices and give them regular shapes like rectangles, triangles, trapezoids, and do a sum. So let's look at this graph and let's say I'm interested in the area under this curve, which is got this equation, 1 third x squared plus 4, and I'm interested in the area from, let's say, x equals 1 to x equals 5. So I'm going to do a little bit of coloring on this. This is the area I want, but it's an unusual shape. So maybe what I will do is I will split that yellow area 
into an equal like slices of equal size, an infinite number of slices of equal size, uh, and those slices will be rectangles. And I'll start at the left hand side for my first rectangle. So let's draw one. How wide will my rectangle be? That's up to you. I'm going to make it one <laughs> unit wide because that's an easy number to find with multiplication. So here's my first rectangle to pull off there. Ish. Okay. Obviously I didn't draw it perfectly, but it goes from one to two. That's a change in X, right? So we have this, oops, that's highlighter. Pause. Let's get back to the pen. We have this change of X here to here. And that's like the base of my rectangle. And to find the height of my rectangle, I just have to find what is happening, what F of one is, right? By subbing one into the equation. And I see that's going to be one over three times one squared plus four, four and a third for the sake of not going crazy. I'm just going to write down 4.33. So the area of this orange rectangle is going to be the base times the height or length times width, whatever you want to call it, 4.33 multiplied by one, because I just decided to make it between one and two. So it's also going to be 4.33. If I had picked rectangles that were only half unit wide would have been different would have needed more rectangles to get to five and I'm going to continue doing this I'm going to make another rectangle that is not what I want to do pause I'm going to make another rectangle and it's going to start at the left hand corner between two and three and there it is and this one I'm going to figure out what f of 2 is. So I'm looking for the point right here. f of 2 is 1 third times 2 squared plus 4, which is 4 over 3 plus 4 is about 5.33. And if I multiply that by my change in x, my base, that's 1, and it stays 5.33. And we can continue on. I've added a couple more, and what that means in order to kind of get that area between 1 and 5, x equal to 1 and 5, I'm going to find two more rectangle areas. The third one will be f of 3, which is 3 plus 4 equals 7, and that's just the math. I'm just using this, this equation that I had. 7 times 1 is 7, and f of 4 is 1 over 3 times 16 plus 4, which is 16 over 3 plus 4, which is about 9.33. And of course, I'm going to get some rounding errors. And if I add up those four areas, I get 26. So I'm proposing the area under this curve between 1 and 5 over the interval 1, 5. I can even put it as 1, 5 with those square brackets is 26. Now, is that an overestimate or an underestimate? I can see a bunch of yellow sticking out the top, so it's not, I know it's actually the exact area has to be more than 26. This situation where I measure from the left hand to make the rectangles creates an underestimate when the function is increasing. I could do it from the other side to try and fix that. Right hand Riemann sums. Same thing, we're going to try and get the area between 1 and 5. There it is again, but this time I'm going to go with a right hand Riemann sum, which is just, I'm going to add up all my rectangles taking the top right of the rectangle instead. And I'm just going to draw this one because I don't want to cover up the graph. So my first rectangle actually goes between 1 and 2 but I start, I have to use f of 2. The nice thing about this is we already did these. <laughs> so we know that f of 2 is 5.33. My next rectangle builds here. f of 3 was 7. And we know that the area, because I'm choosing a delta x, or a base that is 1 unit wide for laziness, and we knew that f of 4, let's say it's about here, 
was 9.33. 9.33 times 1 gives an area of 9.33. And we'll do one more, f of 5. And when I do that math, I get 12.33, which means the area there is 12.33. And this time when I add them all up, I have 34. First time, left-hand Riemann sums, I got 26. This time I get 34. And that makes sense because I know this is an overestimate. Like I've got all this extra area that isn't actually under the curve, but because I'm using these rectangles, they're becoming part of it. How could I be more exact? Smaller rectangles, thinner slices, right? If you were, I'm just going to go on the other side, estimating, and instead of using, you know, a one unit wide one, you just did like a teeny tiny quarter one. <laughs> That's going to be a third. You get a better estimate. So the limit of your number of slices, let's say, approaches infinity. We're not going to go there. We're not going to do the sum notation. Don't worry. <laughs> but that could work. There's also another Riemann sum. You could take the midpoint uh, and try it that way. But let's look at a different method. And you'll probably see this one in a series thing in another co course. We could use a trapezoid rule. And what that does is just instead of dividing into rectangles, we're going to divide into trapezoids. And I've rotated the graph here so it's a little easier to see because we know or we remember that the area of a trapezoid is the top side, the length of the top side plus the length of the bottom times the height of the trapezoid divided by two. So I'm gonna draw on my sideways picture. Actually, I'll draw it first on the normal graph. So really what I'm trying to do is this situation, which is a little hard to visualize how that's a trapezoid until you turn it sideways, where you make your change in X is going to be your height. So here's my trapezoid and suddenly, you know, that's a much better, it's a still a straight line. I'm still screwing up a bit, but that's a much better approximation. So to use our notation, so we had F of one, let's say, plus F of two are going to give me A and B multiplied by change in x, which I chose to be 1 because I was lazy, and divide that by 2. And we already knew that the f of 1 was 4.33. We knew that f of 2 was 5.33. Add those together, multiply by 1, divide by 2, and you get 4.83. And you can continue to do this. You can get this area with another trapezoid that is 5.33 plus 7 times 1 divided by 2. And that will give you, let's write them down, A12 was 4.83, A23 will end up being 6.165, A34, we'll do it in pink, will just be a trapezoid with a top that is 7 and a bottom that is 9.33. 7 plus 9.33 times 1 divided by 2 should give you 8.165. And then A45. Purple to end will give you another trapezoid with a top of 9.33 and a bottom of 12.33. And maybe you can think of how you can have a series that you can make a formula that could cheat this. <laughs> It'll still be fairly painful, but you know, helps a little bit. And you're gonna get 10.83. When you add those all up, you get total area of 29.99. And now, because I know how to find the exact area under a curve, I know I'm much closer, but I'm not exact. Every time I use that kind of straight line instead of the curve line, I am moving further away from the actual answer. So I can make them smaller and smaller. But I feel like there has to be other way, a better way. Like I'm not going to sit here and find, you know, however many little slices there are and add them all together with this Riemann sum or with the trapezoidal rule. 
So what I just want you to take away from this is I can always approximate the area under a continuous curve. It has to be continuous, no jumps, no asymptotes, by cutting that curve up into an infinite number of equally wide rectangles or equally high trapezoids. And the area will just be the sum of all those little slices, all those little areas I found. The more you slice it up, the better the approximation is. This is a big pain. So if I know the area, the equation of the curve from that first slide, I know this area, right? And we talked about it. It was even in another lesson. If you can find the antiderivative, you can get the area between two boundaries. So we just need to find one more tool, not the indefinite integral, but another type of integral that's going to let us find an area, an exact area under a curve. And that's coming up next.